about ourselves. I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint here. So for those of you who, who don't know, we're from the River Institute. This is a picture of our, our nice building here right on the St. Lawrence River, and we're located on the campus of the St. Lawrence College. So here's a slide that's a little bit about me. So my name is Lexi. Um, I'm an educator at the River Institute and you can see some pictures over on the left hand side of the screen. So this is me um, on a whale watching boat that I used to work on. Um, I am a marine biologist and then the one in the middle down at the bottom is me with lots of different rocks and minerals because I also studied geology when I'm in school. So those are the two things that I really enjoy studying. And then there's another picture um, of me doing an in-person program, very similar to the one that we'll be doing today, but back when uh, we were actually allowed to be in person. And I'll let Emily introduce herself. You probably won't be able to see her camera as well as me. Oh, Em, do you want to spotlight me? I realize that probably everybody can't see as well as I thought they could. For sure. That works? Um, okay. I won't be able to see. Oh. <laughs> well, I can't spotlight you, but I continue. So, um, so anyways, my name's Emily, and I am also an educator at the River Institute and a biologist. I am also going to be a teacher soon. Um, so my niche is fish. So all these photos are me doing something to do with fish. Um, I enjoy going out seine netting, being out in the boat, and I really can't wait for the summer to come back again. As you can see in all these photos, we adapted to COVID last year for field season. I like yeah. that all of yours are, are with a mask too. Yeah. I volunteered <laughs> off. <laughs> Realistic. <laughs> all right, so today we're gonna look at aquatic invertebrate ecology. So first um, to start, um, we wanna make sure that you know that this is interactive. So we welcome you to turn on your mics or go in the chat and uh, let us know your thoughts or answer some questions. So to begin, what is an aquatic invertebrate? We wanna know what you think it is. So you can go in the chat or you can turn on your mic and share with us what you think an aquatic invertebrate is. Okay, so we'll, we'll share it with you. <laughs> so an aquatic invertebrate is an invertebrate that lives in the water and it has, does not have a backbone, okay? So, um, yeah, no backbone. Yes, thank you, Brittany. Exactly. And it lives in the water. And it means something in the water, as it said right there. <laughs> so next, what is an insect? Does anyone want to share what they think an insect is, specifically? Um, I'll answer. Is this the one where they actually have, like, exoskeletons and stuff? Yes, all of them have an exoskeleton, for sure as arthropods do. So maybe another way to ask this question is we've got two things, two different um, organisms up on the screen, a ladybug and a spider. Do we think one or both of them is an insect and which one? Yeah, the ladybug's an insect, that's right. So if we go to our next slide, we can break down what an insect is for. So there are specific parts that make an organism an insect. So number one would be having a head, usually with antennae. Number two, they always have a thorax and the legs are attached to the thorax. And then finally they have an abdomen. So this is a little ant here. So this is a terrestrial organism. And insects always have six legs attached at the thorax. So the number of legs is important to make an insect. So since a spider has eight right away, you know that a spider can't be an insect because they have too many legs. So we're going to do a little quiz with you guys. So we're going to go through some organisms together and we want you to tell us if you think they are an invertebrate or a vertebrate. So does it have a backbone or no backbone? So this is a perch. Does this perch have a backbone or no backbone? That's right, it's a vertebrate for sure. Here's a dance with fly. Um, do you believe that this is a vertebrate or an invertebrate? You're also welcome to turn on your mic if you'd like. Yeah, it's an invert for sure. And this would be an earthworm. And earthworms are really interesting because they're actually not native to North America. They're technically invasive, but they've been here a long time. So they're not considered invasive anymore. 
Is this an invert or does it have a vertebrate? Would anyone else like to answer? I'm going to say it's a uh, um, in or vertebrae. So it is an invertebrate. It does not have a backbone. And a snake. Would it be an invertebrate or a vertebrate? Vertebrate. Yes, absolutely. It's commonly mistaken that they're an invertebrate because of how their spine moves so well. So this is an example of the uh, vertebral column of a snake. Lots of little pieces. It's almost all just one big backbone. <laughs> All right, so moving on, where do you guys think that we can find our aquatic invertebrates? We're gonna go through a little uh, quiz here again together. Do you think that we can find them here in this water body? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, absolutely. What about this one? This is more of a Martian habitat, maybe a fen. Do you think that they can live here? Yep. Absolutely. Yes. What about here in the big blue sea? Yes, absolutely. So aquatic invertebrates are virtually everywhere, even in like puddles and stuff. So you'll find them everywhere you go. They're not going to be the same everywhere you go as they have different tolerances. So we'll get into that soon. So why do you think it is that we study aquatic invertebrates at the river and otherwise? Any idea? Um. Uh, don't they let us know like history and contaminant loads and such like that? Absolutely. So they're bio indicators. So, um, so they let us know if they're if an area is polluted. So here we have a little banum. This is a uh, mayfly, and they prefer living in an area without pollution. So they're quite sensitive. On the uh, right side of the screen is an amphipod, otherwise known as a scud or a side swimmer. And they are more tolerable to pollution and such. So they live everywhere. So they indicate whether an environment is healthy or not, or maybe there's something missing. As well, they are part of the food chain. So invertebrates are at the bottom of the food chain, and without them, fish could not survive. So they're really important that way. All right, does anyone know how we sample aquatic invertebrates? With a DNA. Pardon me? With a D-net. <laughs> With a D-net. Awesome. So yeah, you, you know what it's called. It's a D-net. It's in the shape of a D. So it has a very, very small mesh so that the invertebrates can't get out once they're in there. So we're going to turn on a little video here. And this is an example of the kick and scoop method for collecting um, aquatic invertebrates. So as you can see, our sampler is doing a figure eight motion while kicking their feet in the sediment. So this is uh, kicking the sediment up so it's in the water and then the net touching it up. So the net is not touching the bottom, it's just about, it's supposed to be about five centimeters or so off the bottom. And there we go, there's our sample. So there's probably a lot more in there than we think there is. It's are pretty small. I'll get to the next one. Yeah, these are different sampling methods. Um, I think Lexi will go through this one with you guys. Yeah, so we talked about the DNet already. That's a really good tool for if you're just one person and then you're in a, a smaller body of water, like a stream or a creek or something. A kick net requires at least three people to use and is usually best for fast moving water environments, um, maybe a little bit a quicker of a creek, some place where there's lots of rocks, because usually it's really good to move the rocks around upstream and have the, the invertebrates drift into the net that would be situated downstream. And then the Ekman dredge is good for kind of two different situations. One where the bottom is a little bit farther away, harder for you to reach because it's deeper, so you can drop one down on a line. Um, and I have a little animation here, so it closes like that um, and does a big scoop. So the other reason it's really good to use is because you actually have a measured sample size when you use a dredge compared to a DNet or a cake net. All right. So how do you think we identify them? Do you have any ideas on what tools you might use? Um, an identification or identification key? Yeah. So we don't use this kind of key up in the corner. We use a dichotomous key. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this is an example of a dichotomous key that we like to use at the Reverend Institute. 
honestly, the simpler the better. Um, and you go through a series of questions and visuals to guide your thinking to find out which invertebrate you're looking at. So you're looking at key features all the time. So we're gonna practice together. We're gonna look at an organism and figure out what it is, okay? All right, so our first organism is going to be so the, the first question first is going oh. to be <laughs> whether or not our, yeah. orga our, our organism has obvious legs. Yeah. <laughs> so take a gander and take note of its legs if it has any. So does our organism have obvious legs? Anyone? Yeah, yeah for sure. So our next question is, how many pairs of legs does it have? Does it have three, four, or more than four? Yeah, Lexi's smaller now, so you can see Yeah, now you can read all the questions. So can anyone tell us, does it have three pairs of legs, four pairs of legs, or more from what you can remember? There we are. There's our little friend. Oh, it has three pairs from what three I see? Pairs. Yeah, for sure. So that brings us on to our next question. Um, does it have two pairs of fully developed wings or no wings? Or not fully developed wings anyway. Let's take another gander here together. So what do you guys think? Not fully developed. Exactly, not fully developed. You can see the, the wing buds there on the back, so it, whoop, it will eventually have wings. <laughs> yeah, because it's a larvae. All right, so that moves us on to the next question, which is, does our organism have a tail or no tail? Oh, I would say a tail, I think. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, those little work things at the end. Nice. Okay, so now we have to look at the specific parts of the tail and what it looks like. So does this tail um, have one tail or hooks, have two long tails or three tails total? Uh, it looks like it has three tails. Yeah, for sure, three tails. So that brings us to our last question. So are these three tails segmented? Are they feathery or are they short and spiky? So here in the corner, the left-hand corner, you'll see an example of short and spiky. At the top right, you'll see an example of segmented. And then feathery. <laughs> so this is our, our organism. So that makes it a damselfly larvae. So most of the aquatic organisms, uh, aquatic invertebrates are out as larvae in the water and end up being in uh, terrestrial for their adult life. So the damselfly is a great example of this. All right, so now we can look at um, some specimens under the microscope. Um, I guess how many specimens we will look at can be up to you guys. Um, we can start with one and then go from there. I just have to fix this. Okay, there we go. Cool. So, I don't know if you want to talk about this one, Em, and I'll switch back and forth with the key. Cool, so we have a bit of choice of what we'll do here. So this is a, uh, a, microscope, a microscope that Lexi has live on the other end. Um, so this is our little organism that we're gonna to try to identify. Now, we can do this together, or you can try to identify it by yourself and let us know what you think it is in the chat. What would you guys prefer? It's up to you. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear the last part. No problem. So we have the choice of you guys working on your own with the key to figure out what this organism is, or we can work through it together with you. Um, I'd like to put forth an answer? <laughs> uh, is the dichotomous key available online? Um, we could always put the screen up. So maybe for this one, we'll work through it together to start. How does that sound? Sure. Cool. We'll kind of do like the first organism. 
So we took a little look already. So let's decide, um, does it have obvious legs? So yes, so we're gonna start with this side of the cube. All right, so how many pairs of legs does this organism have? Uh, three. Yeah, so it has three pairs of legs. Oh, and there's Lexi pointing, awesome. <laughs> okay, so, so we can make it a bit bigger now that we yeah, we have <laughs> awesome. So um, now that we know it has three pairs of legs, um, does it have any wings, or are, does it have no wings that are not very developed wings? So what you can see. I think I would say no wings. It looks yeah, like. I agree with you for sure. So that brings us to. Does it have tail appendages or no tail appendages? This one might be a little a little bit tricky. It yeah. might trick you. <laughs> <laughs> this one might be a little complicated. It's hard to see sometimes with the technology we're using. See if I can put a, a bigger one on the other side, that might help. Oops. I think I would say no tail appendages. Oh, there we go. There's this is a one. really big one that you can see a little bit better. And that's like the butt end. <laughs> what do you guys want to make this visual? So yeah, it does have tail appendages and <laughs> yeah. yes. So it, it was hard to see on the first one for sure. So this is a much better um, visual of it. So yeah, it does have tail appendages. So now we're gonna look at um, whether it, it is a uh, has one tail or hooks, if it has two long tails, or if it has three tails. So what do you guys think? It has a spiky tail. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it does have three tails. It's not super clear like our last organism, but yes, it's a spiky um, tail. So it is a dragonfly larvae. And the dragonfly larvae can be very variable as they go through their stages. So they all kind of look different. It's not always the same. Yeah, even these guys, like there's a tiny one and then like this one's way bigger. And I can put in maybe my pinky finger for scale once I get it. <laughs> So that's my finger. So it's pretty big, this one. All right. Do you guys want to try another one? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, I'm going to try and figure out where the center is under the microscope. Ah. There we go. So here's a fun little fellow. So I'm gonna try and do this. So if we go for our first question again, so I can switch between these two sides of the key. So we have options, obvious legs or no obvious legs. Oh, it has obvious legs. Obvious legs, so I'll go, oops, that's not what I want. How do I go back? Oops. There you go. Okay, so obvious legs side of the key. I'll just keep moving around my little window there. So our options at the top are three pairs of legs, four pairs of legs, and more than four pairs of legs. So I'll make it a little bigger so you can see. And my trick I usually say is if you can count the number of legs, then you'll know how many that it has. And if you can't count them, then there's probably more than four pairs. More than four? Yeah. So this okay. one has more than four pairs of legs. So 
Our next question, if we're looking over here in the top, is does it have a flattened body or does it look like a lobster? <laughs> Flattened body. A flattened body, yep. And then the two different types of flattened bodies that we see. So some of them are flattened this way. So like their arms and legs kind of stick out to the side like this. Or if they're flattened front to back and then all their legs and uh, stick out to the sides. So those are our two options. Flattened from side to side or flattened from front to back. Side to side. Yeah, side to side. So this one, oh, this one right here is a side swimmer. Right so on. As an amphipod, side swimmer, a scud. Um, and these little guys are interesting because they are crustacean and they just lack a carapace. So they're like a little shrimp and they're detrivores. So they like eat dead things and they're found everywhere. They're one of my personal favorites. They're pretty cute. <laughs> I hope by the end of this, you all have a favorite. <laughs> all right, let's try. Different one. Ah. So this one's interesting. So there's a little bit more to it. From what you can tell, does this one have obvious legs? Um, I don't think I see any legs, but I could be wrong. <laughs> so we'll manipulate it a little more here. Maybe if I look on the other side, is that better? Can anyone see the little protrusions at the uh, tip of it? Yeah. So those are little legs sticking out. There we go. There we are. I have like so many. There. there. Perfect. It does have legs. All those legs. Okay. Oops. Can we can we count how many from the from the image? How many pairs that it has? So maybe I can turn it because I think one of them's tucked underneath there. What I put on the other side. <laughs> I don't know how to get it back under. <laughs> Oh, there we go. So can, if we can count, there's one right there, and one pair right there, and one pair kind of closer up under there. So this one has three pairs. Perfect. Move this window up over there. That is three pairs of legs. So the next question would be, are there any wings on our little organism? That you can see anyway. <laughs> no. There's wings. No, so that's right. There's no wings on this little fellow. So there's no wings. So that brings us down to tail appendages. So from what you could see earlier, do you think that this organism has a tail? No. That's right. So there's no tail on this blue guy. So that brings us down to four different organisms. So does this bot, um, organism have what looks like suction cup legs? Does it have a tube-like body? Is it flattened and looks like a little coin? Or does it have two um, posterior hooks and lives in a cake? <laughs> the last one. Yeah, so that that's right. So it is a caddisfly larvae, and it is actually inside a case that is in the station. So they make little cases um, so that they're protected so that they can grow, and they make these cases out of whatever they can find in their environment. It is actually known that um, jewelry stores will put these little guys in a tank with gold, and then they'll wait for them to make um, little uh, pieces of jewelry out of their little cases, and then they sell them in stores. They're really, really cool. And then, so the first one, like this one, the, oh my goodness, I'm really bad at doing everything in reverse under the microscope. So this one is kind of like little bits of wood, 
And then this one here is more like these big long sticks. And then this one over here is more like little pebbles and stones that they use. They're very crafty little fellows. <laughs> I think my favorite ones, they make their cases out of grass and they like twist up the pieces of grass into like these tiny little spirals. How do they um like keep everything together? Like the rocks and everything? Like how do they keep it all stuck together in a they perfect tube? Use their spit like a glue, like bees use to build like honeycombs. Um, and birds, um, like there's a lot of birds that spit to to build their nests too. So it's got like adhesive properties. Okay. That's a good one. I'm gonna put a couple under there. So this one might be a little trickier than some of the other ones because it's really small. My bugs again. There we go. Okay, so now go back to the first question. Do you guys think that this organism has obvious legs or no? Uh, no legs. That's it. So it doesn't have any legs. So we're going to get other two this time. So I'm just going to shrink that up so we can see our, our options. Okay, thanks, Becky. So does it have a shell or no shell? Uh, no shell. No shell. No okay. shell. So I'll make it bigger now <laughs> so we can see it better. So from what you guys can tell, does it have an un unsegmented body or a segmented body? So is it made up of sections or is it smooth like a tube? Segmented? Absolutely. And now we're gonna look at whether or not it has an obvious head or no obvious head. So take a look a little closer if you can. It looks like it has a little head. Yeah, I think it has like a little head showing. Yeah, for sure. Right. So it has a little head. There. It shows up. The mouse shows up in a different place. <laughs> All right. So now does it have a soft head, so not super visible, but it's there, or a hardened head? So it's probably going to be a bit more visible. Hardened. Awesome. So now this brings us down to four different organisms. So this would have thick legs and tufts of uh, hair near the tail. Does it have a breathing tube and large thorax between the head and the abdomen? Does it have a suction cup and two fans on the end? Or does it swim like a stick and have a tuft of hair on the tail? <laughs> if it swims like a stick, it's a little hard to tell because this one is dead, but. <laughs> yeah. And you can use the visuals to guide your thinking as well. Ms. Can I take a oh, oh, sorry, sorry Megan. <laughs> it's okay, you got it. <laughs> So did you guys pick which one? Sorry, I might have put out there. Go ahead, Brittany. No, no, you, you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll guess it's a mosquito larvae. Yeah, it is a mosquito larvae. Aculicity. Awesome. So these guys I like I think are really cool because I I would have never thought before that a mosquito larvae is like super easy to ID, but this really big thorax between the head and the rest of the body is like a super big indication that this is a mosquito larvae and not another type of fly. And then over on this end, you can see like this kind of little tail protrusion, and this is actually like a breathing tube. So they'll actually hold themselves upside down on the surface of the water and this little tube sticks above the water and they can uh, breathe through this little tube, which is super neat. So those are all the specimens that we had prepared for you guys. Does anybody have any questions for us? I'm going to try and... Whether it be about inverts or stuff about the River Institute as well. I just have a question about the mosquitoes. It's like, since it's so tiny and yeah, they like just float above the water, like you said, or bob upside down. Um, would you be able to see that like yourself? If you just went out in the water, would you be able to see a bunch of little 
mosquito larvae is above the water? So they're big enough that like I think if you looked like really closely and you kind of like know what you're looking for, you'd be able to see them. And usually mosquito larvae, from what I know, um, like to be in more standing water, like not as fast moving. So you're less likely to see them like in a creek. But if you have like a bird bath or like something like that in your backyard and you're looking for them, then likely you like that's a place that you could see them if you know what you're looking for. Snye Wetland, Megan. What was that? Or what was that, Brittany? Um, whenever we went to the wetland in Sny, we they were there. I think I took a picture. I could show you. Another indicator is they have like a whipping motion. So if you do see them, they're kind of like whipping back and forth. Mm. The Corona mids do uh, like a really similar thing to that too, like this little kind of like J shape and they're super cool. And you can see them um, super easily. I find like if I'm in a in the water and I, I don't wear my waders a lot in the summertime when it's nice I'm usually wearing just like shorts and you can really see them on your legs and there are a lot like those ones are get like bright red color and you can see them like squirming around on your legs and they <laughs> they feel a little itchy. <laughs> Any other questions before we go? Um, which invertebrate do you find you find the least of? Ooh, that's, that's a good really question. good question. Um, so some that we don't see frequently. Personally, like I have I ever seen a Placoptera like straight from the stream? I'm not sure. So that's like a stonefly larva. They're pretty rare and they're super sensitive to pollution. So we really only see them in super healthy um, water bodies. Um, um, fish stomachs, I think. Mm, yeah um hydra i think are like yes maybe partly because they're really hard to see because they're so small um but we don't see those super often and i also don't think like leeches and like flatworms we see like a ton i think more frequently than the other two examples that i just gave but uh we we usually get excited when we see those two because we don't see them super often and the flatworms are are super cool when in a sample like the way that they move around the dish when you take a sample is super fun so we like so to the, see them the smooth moving train with little eyeballs they're very cute <laughs> <laughs> they're my favorite too i think they're all my favorite <laughs> they're all pretty cute yeah so you said you don't find leeches often like i find we don't catch them in samples very often like we'll see them um in some places when you lift up the rocks like stuck under the rocks but most of the time when i'm taking samples like we don't get them in the samples which i'm not i'm not really sure what's up with that to be honest <laughs> yeah it also depends on the environment too there are some giant ones at gary fenn i believe in alexandria oh. if you're interested <laughs> <laughs> You can see them right off the side of like the culvert. Oh wow. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I've seen some big ones um sucking on um snapping turtles before. Gives me the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> I like them when they're smaller. <laughs> yeah, we usually catch them with our legs, not with our nets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the proper way to remove a leech if you ever get one. Um, it used to be the old thing was salt, but that actually um, isn't great because you shock them essentially and they spit the bacteria into you. Um, so you want to use a credit card and kind of <laughs> scrape them off if you can. Mm. They have a good hold, so you have to you have to take your time and scrape away. Or like a flat, like a blade, kind of like flat against your skin. If you've got like a pocket knife, we usually use those if we're out in the field too. Yeah, <laughs> the smaller ones don't have as good a hold, so they're able to able to kind of flip them off but the bigger they get, the more equipment you might need. <laughs> Good to know, because I actually recently used salt on somebody. <laughs> a couple years ago, actually. <laughs> now I know. Mm. It was probably less traumatic for yourself to just use salt. <laughs> <laughs> they just let go. But what kind of uh, things would they like spit back into you? Is there like some sort of like illness that you would acquire as a result of this or just a reaction? It's like a, it's, I don't think it's really like a, you know, like a, the ticks carry Lyme disease. Like, I don't think there's anything like that. I think it's more just like, you might have like a site specific infection. Like, it, like if you leave a scab though, or something like that, like, I don't think it would be anything crazy. Okay. 
Ooh. All right. Well, thank you guys for having us today. Thanks yeah. so much for coming out. I know I enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you. Yeah, we're glad to have subjects to talk about. Th yeah, thank you for presenting. It was really good information you showed us, and I really liked it. It was fun. Thanks. Thank you. And we'll see you guys again tomorrow at 10 a.m. for the, the K to 6 group, I believe. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Sounds great. See you then. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you.